of hopefully many conferences, and not just conferences, but the first of many actions that will begin in this diocese to work as a community in the community and to work for the benefit of the local community in a way that is true to our faith and true to our history and true to our traditions. This is um, actually a very important meeting that we're doing right now and I really thank the guys from the East Coast for uh, encouraging us and uh, helping us and pushing us in this. It might not be the same thing that was in the minds of, of you guys, but uh, know that you guys have started something good and something of bene benefit here in Southern California. Um, the topic is the idea of local mission, mission in the local church, or the local church's mission. And uh, there's a couple of words that we have to understand in terms of how we're going to approach this topic when we talk about evangelism, when we talk about missionary work, and when we talk about uh, what the church ought to be doing. When we talk about evangelism, that's an easy word. Evangelism, preaching and bringing the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ uh, to this world, to everybody and to anyone. And the missionary work includes this preaching, includes evangelism, which should include it, as well as other aspects of offering our love and our time and our care and our services and our goods to those who are in need, the naked, the hungry, the sick, the imprisoned, all for the sake of Christ. And we do that not necessarily with a mindset or with a few words that we would say, but we do that as being Christians, as being Christians. And so the first topic that we were that we're here gathered to talk about is is mission and activity of the Orthodox Church or is it only something done by Catholics and Protestants and other people? And the answer is very simply yes. And I could end it right now, but <laughs> let me go ahead and explain that. Not only is it a proper activity for the Orthodox Church, but it's a necessary activity. It's a necessary activity of the Church. And as I will speak about it, it's a necessary activity not only for the church as a whole, but for every parish and for every individual. So, if you were to ask me, can a Coptic church exist without praying the liturgy? I would say quite simply no. Can a Coptic church exist without doing missionary work? I'd say no, it can't, it's impossible. But to, you know, not to sadden you, but there is this common phenomenon that happens in our church and happens everywhere, it happens in society everywhere and treatises have been written on it um, uh, on the idea that once you give somebody a job, everybody else tends to say, that person's doing it, thank God. So what we've had in our minds is the development of these professional missionaries. That's not what the church is about. It's never how the church has functioned in the idea of these professional missionaries who devote their life and everybody else is just, you know, doesn't really have to worry about that task. As long as we are in the world, Christ says, we are the light of the world. And as we are in the world and as we are the light of the world, that means as just as a light shines by nature of its existence, we ought to shine by nature of, of our existence. And in our day and age, unfortunately, unfortunately, it seems that what has crept into our church is that we completely miss the idea of missionary work, that we are called to do it. And it's so glaringly apparent in our attitude towards one small part of the Divine Liturgy. One small, can anybody guess what that small part is in the Divine Liturgy that is our call to being missionaries? What's that? Well, no, that, that is, yes, of course, that is why we gathered and that's, we're going to get to that part, but there's something of a, you can say, ascending forth into the world. Daniel. No, it's even further in the liturgy. Is it when the, the priest says uh, that section that has the rightly dividing the word of truth? Uh, no, we pray for the people that are rightly dividing the word of truth. It is the very end of the liturgy. Going through. The love of God the Father, the grace of His only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the gift of the commun and communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. It's not like going in peace and you take that peace and you put it in your pocket and mm -hmm. you walk off with it. But it's a going to, to share all of that with the world. In the Catholic Church, I went to Catholic school for uh, high school, and I used to always remember the priest, how they said it similar, very similar to us. They said, um, go in peace, 
to love and serve the Lord. To love and serve the Lord. That is our sending out into the world. And that's why it's called um, dismissal. Dismissal, or you know, then we have the mission that comes from the dismissal. And that's also uh, what we, you know, in our minds, we take that and we leave with everything that we've gathered here in this world. But, but in our church, in our church, and I don't mean to call it, but unfortunately, we have communion people bolt as if that was the only thing that we were coming for. I got Jesus, and that's all that matters. It belongs to me, and now I'm leaving. When that's not the attitude or the mentality that we're supposed to have in church. The mentality is that we come, we partake, and then we go out to share. It's called apostolic benediction. Hmm. Apostolic benediction. What does it mean? Apostolic? Sent. Yeah. To be sent out. To be sent out. The good word of sending out into the world. And so we, we can't be oblivious to this, that in our worship um, that we set up, you know, we can't be oblivious to this idea of the mi- being sent out as missionaries, and and we have to really think about the structure of what we have going on after church. You know, people bolt the, the second they take communion to, you know, drink coffee and talk about the latest Orthodox news or whatnot or the politics in Egypt, or even just the distribution of Orban right at the end of liturgy, right away, and the kids go nuts over that. You know, and this is this is something that we have to understand the mentality of our church. Now, it's been said. It's been said by historians, you know, who have been studying mission and understanding the mission of the church, that the church's mission, I'm going to read a quote, the church's mission was fulfilled through its existence. Its resources and its institutions were how it fulfilled the mission rather than through professional missionaries. That the mission activity was neither a separated occasion of witness nor the task of some chosen and professional ones from Christian communities. It was rather a common witness of Christians in the early church, born, carried by everyone, in every way, and in every form of life. And that can be the reason of the fact that the witnesses wandering from one place to another were not necessarily trained, were not professional missionaries, but were followers of the apostolic life in the world. And today, I'm I'm just going to share certain categories of mission that can be accomplished or that was accomplished in the early church and certain stories of how great great missionaries of our of our church great saints great people accomplished those mission those missions and those aspects and I, I hope that what will happen is we can apply it and understand it in our day and age. Uh, first thing that has to be said is that there's nothing remarkable absolutely nothing remarkable about the strategy or the tactics of the first Christians. There was nothing, you know, you know, spectacular about what they did. But what was remarkable was their conviction, was their passion, and was their determination to live out this life and to act as Christ's ambassadors no matter what. No matter what. So it wasn't what they said or how they said it, but it was this conviction that they had within themselves. And there were five approaches, typically, and we're going to talk about these five approaches and the six groups of people. But we're not going to go through it. We're just going to focus on a few of them. Five approaches that were wonderful. And I, I think, you know, very much in, in the open-mindedness of these people, these individuals of the church and the early church, was first and foremost that they engaged the secular world. It wasn't simply that they talked among themselves, Christians talking to Christians. They would go out, they would study the philosophies, they would learn the ideas of their culture. If not, I mean, they grew up in it. It's almost like us, we've grown up here in America, even though America is supposed to be this Christian society. Not necessarily everything you learn or, or, or soak up is Christian. But we know how to speak to Americans. You know, at least I know how to speak to Americans. And I know all of you probably know the same. I know how to speak to East Coasters more than I know how to speak to West Coasters, but I'm learning. Um, but we know, we know, and they, and they also, they engaged in, in the secular world. So you had personal conversations that took place at the laundromat, uh, at the bar, yeah, uh, street corners, um, and they spoke in intimate circles. I'm kind of moving a little bit past the book of Acts. We'll go back to the book of Acts and what we see there. But this was the first thing. The second thing that's 
uh, you know, wonderful and, and, and effective, and it was a, another approach of them, was the personal encounters. There were many new Christians, and even in our day and age, who regarded their close relationships with their friends or family as reasons for entering the faith. You know, think about that close person. It's like, you know what, I'm, you know, I'm proud to be, or I, I could see a lot of Christianity from this person. You know, I can talk about, for me, for example, my father. I can see so much I learned just from my father, not from what he told me, but just how he acted in life. He's still alive. I'm just saying about the past. Um, and, and it's funny when we talk about, you know, how we can, you know, engage people in our day and age in our society. Uh, one priest mentioned, he said, you know, 100% of people that you bring to church will be in church. Right? And that's, that's really good. That's a good, you know, 5% of, you know, priests, you know, basically missionaries work, 5% is done by priests. Most of it is done by the congregation. And then they, he said, you know, he had all of these statistics, but I thought it was, it was you know, the most appropriate for us is 100% of those that we bring are here. The other place that often gets overlooked is home. And this is, was an approach in the early church and an approach for us. Home was a place for speaking about the gospel. Not just home among family, but think about our gatherings. When we gather, you know, there's food, there's worship, there's learning, there's communication, and there's companionship, fellowship, all of that around in, in a home. And so you see that the, the church homes that later developed into church planting. You see the mentality. Now a lot of us, you know, I for one came to my church um, just uh, when, it, when I, I'm talking about when I first, back in, in Jersey, uh, it opened. I was already 10 or 11 years old, so it's open. So it was a bunch of families that just kind of came artificially together to gather at this church. But back then it would be a group of friends, a group of close companions, and then that develops into a strong church, right? Which you guys gather, when we gather in a home, the mentality is the same, the attitudes are the same, and then and, and the, the, the knowing each other and being close to each other in that aspect is the same, and then that develops into a church, and that was the, the fourth approach, was after these home churches, uh, the, the real churches started to be planted, the ones that became, you know, legal. Uh, don't, don't forget that back then to be Christian was almost like putting a death sentence on yourself. Um, and then after one, and then there was a, a, a final approach that's important for us to never neglect and never to forget and to learn from the early church was the emphasis on the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is the one that works inside the church as a whole and in Christians individually. And what is so important about the Holy Spirit and the emphasis on the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is the one that's working. He's working in the one hearing as well as the one that's speaking, but working in a different way in the early church, which I don't know how to process, but we'll talk about it anyway, is that back then, people didn't just hear the word, they saw. They saw in the actions of the, of the people preaching. And now how did they see? They saw in the casting out of demons and in the miracles and the speaking of tongues and all the gifts of the Spirit that were evident back then. But then the question is left for us, how is it evident now in us? And that's a question I put to you, and we'll talk about that, if you like, in a little bit. As um, leaving these five approaches, um, in the early church, there were six, actually I'll talk about four, four encounters, but I'll only focus on one, four different evangelic or evangelistic or missionary activities that were carried out. The one we talked about was the personal encounter. Before I was telling you that this was an approach, now we're going to talk about how effective this approach was. The second is in the, um, specifically that they went to the Jews, they went to the pagans, they went to the inquirers, sorry, and there's a fifth one, they went to the faithful. And the faithful one, we talk about missionary activity, and we talk about evangelism, we're going to see that evangelizing or re-evangelizing to the faithful is, is important. And we're going to discuss what that means. But in the personal encounters in the early church, we see, and when you study, that many people were converted and that their way of life became drastically different from 
uh, what they were before. Think about, you have to think about society back then. As depraved as we might think society is now, society was much worse back then. Forget about, forget about you know, drinking and you know, sexual activity in the bathhouses. Just put those on the side. They were, it was no problem whatsoever, abortion and to kill even an infant or to get, sell your children into slavery. All of that was common and was acceptable and were normal when it came to society back then. So now enter the Christian message. And you didn't have whole households necessarily coming uh, all, all the time. Like we, you know, there's a few households that we have read, read about or we read about in the book of Acts. But you might have a wife who has to deal with just the beast of a husband. Or a husband who has to deal with a, a wife or children that have to deal with parents. And we know from the stories in the Synexarian and also from our studies of history that this was not an easy, um, uh, easy way for somebody to enter into the Christian faith. So when things, there, Justin Martyr, who's in the second century, and I'll talk a lot about him today because he's one of these wonderful examples from the end of the first century, beginning of the second century. <clears throat> but he wrote about a woman who was um, entering into the church and she, she became Christian and then her husband was, as, as she described it, and as he described it, just a lecherous man who spent years, um, you know, just torturing his wife. Not physically, but just doing everything that would torture a Christian who wants to live a sincere life. And when she wanted to leave, her friends and companions told her, no, stay, just for the hope that he might convert. This man went to Alexandria, believe it or not, and things got worse and uh, not better. And so what ended up happening was she finally decided she couldn't take it anymore. She put a file, she filed for a divorce. You know, back then marriage was through the state, so she just filed for a divorce in the state. And what did he do? He told the emperor that she was Christian, almost, you know, kind of giving her up and, uh, uh, to be killed. And so society back then was deeply depraved. So I, I don't want you to underestimate the idea of personal encounter. It's not just, you know, you talk to your best friend, but you talk to those who are around you who might be accepting, but most often might not be accepting. But it's this um, ability for them back then, what we need to learn about now, this ability for them to engage uh, the society back then. Tertullian, who was also in the second century, writes about the big difference between Christian morals and the morals of our society, or of the society back then. When we celebrate a feast, like we'll celebrate Pentecost tomorrow, uh, we celebrate it with sobriety, with piety, with worship. Um, when they celebrate feasts, Romans, you know, there's, there's drinking, there's carousing, there's carousing through the streets, uh, there's all types of immoral and, and, and just diabolical pleasure that's engaged in, not to mention, as we said before, all the other uh, evils that were done by society. So, what was the Christian witness like back then? It was a silent refusal to participate in these activities. How many times have we heard that in our youth meetings and in our um, you know, high school meetings when we were growing up? Just don't participate. But we see how drastic that was back then and how important it was that, yeah, maybe it didn't lead to you being the most popular person in the world and possibly led to you being uh, killed. But that was how they broke through uh, the society back then was able to preach this message, if not through silent refusal. Now, of course, it wasn't just silent refusal that was the way in which they engaged society. There's a wonderful story of two early martyrs, Perpetua and Felicity. Perpetua and Felicity, this was about the end of the section, second century. And Perpetua's father, do, do we know the story of Perpetua and Felicity? Okay. For those of you that don't know the story, you must read the story of Perpetua, uh, the story of her martyrdom. Um, there are, you know, I think sometimes we get disengaged, and I'll, I'll say this on the air, we sort of feel sort of like these stories tend to be uh, a little exaggerated. However, there are a lot of the stories are not, and St. Uh, Saint Perpetua and St. Felicity's story is one of those stories that's not exaggerated. The ones that are kind of eyewitness, first-hand accounts that we have many of them. The story of, uh, of St. Polycarp, the story of St. Ignatius, the stories uh, from that time period, the first and second century, second and third century, 
they give us a wonderful window into the life, into the mindset, and into the activities of these people. Perpetua, Perpetua was a catechumen, probably. She wasn't even, you know, uh, fully Christian, at least in, in, in some versions. Now, she had a father, she had just had a child, and she was one of these high society women. Um, and it, it's worth our time at another, another maybe, you know, if those of you who are interested, we could talk about what was the Roman household like. But she was a high, one of these high society, well-educated women, and she had, um, uh, uh, she, was, she was placed in, in, in jail for her belief in Christ, and she gave birth in jail. She was nursing in jail, and her father came to her, and she he was pleading with her, for the sake of your child, please give this faith up. For the sake of, and, and think about it, for the mothers who have nursed children or the people that have children, to, to be put in that situation where you have to choose your child or Christ, it's not an easy situation. But then on top of it, you'd say, for the sake of, of my gray hairs, you know, for the sake of your father, please give this up, give up this faith. But Perpetual was strong in her faith and she preached to him. But in the end, I mean, it says that he went away very sad. Didn't say that he was, you know, converted and took the message. but. And, and why I'm kind of giving you the negative side of the story is because our, sometimes our um, desires to always win or to always be successful leads us to be scared to lose, leads us to be scared to kind of be embarrassed, leads us to be scared that what if I speak about Christ to this person and, you know, this person turns and starts to make fun of what is so precious to me. And this is what, uh, you know, kind of showing these examples that we have nothing to lose and that many greater people before us have done this and engaged in this activity and it's something that we have to embrace in our day and age. Many in the early church bore witness to Christ through their death, not through their words. And the witness that was given through their death was a powerful witness. Justin Martyr, as I mentioned before, and I'll, again, I'll, I'll get to him in a little bit, but he writes about the conversation, in a conversation he was having with a Jewish rabbi, his dialogue with Trifo, he says, now it is evident that no one can terrify or subdue, subdue us Christians who have believed in Jesus. Nothing in this world can do it, for it is plain that even though we're beheaded, we're crucified, we're thrown to wild beasts, chains and fire and other kinds of torture, we do not give up our confession, but the much, but the more such things happen, the more do others, and in larger numbers become faithful, and the worshipers of God, uh, uh, and, and worshipers grow with God through the name of Jesus. And Justin's conversion was was remarkable. He was he was a philosopher. He had nothing to do with Christianity. He was a convert, but he was a philosopher who we're going to talk about Justin, and we're going to talk about the person who preached to Justin. Justin was a philosopher who was basically engaged in the, in, in the study of Plato. You know, you could say one of his disciples. Justin Martyr uh, lived, and if you see an icon of Justin Martyr in the, in the Eastern Orthodox Church, you'll see that he's wrapped as a, as a philosopher. He's in the philosopher's garb. He doesn't give that up when he, when he becomes Christian. But he's engaged one day in meditation by the sea, and an old man just happens to be there. You know, he's kind of in this desert area. And so Justin Martyr begins to speak with this man, you know, what, how is it that you're here? You know, they start a conversation. And then they go, you know, the conversation gets bigger and bigger. Why are you here? Well, I'm here to meditate. What are you meditating on? Um, and uh, it goes from a discussion about God to a discussion of knowledge, to a discussion of the soul, and by this time, he's won Justin's ear. Justin is now listening very intently. Then he begins to speak to him about teachers much older than Plato. They are wise men, much older than this man that you've learned so much from. They're called prophets. And they speak about God. They speak about God having heard from God. And they speak about the coming of this Messiah Christ, who in our time, you know, a couple hundred years, a hundred years ago, was here and walk the earth. And in this, it says, just like in the road to Emmaus with the disciples, Justin says, my heart was on fire. Right? You see the, the Holy Spirit working in him and working through this man who won him over 
by speaking his language. Speaking his language. And that goes so far to speak the language of the people. And then what's so remarkable about this is that he is discussing this. Justin is discussing his conversion with a Jew. Right? So he's saying, I love what I love because somebody gave me your books. And I was reading your prophets. And I was reading what, what you know, should bring you to God and to this faith. So you see the wisdom in how he's approaching it. He's, he's this philosopher uh, who, who learns from this old man, is given the, uh, some, some books from the Old Testament, turns it around and is speaking to this, to this um, Jew who wants to know about Christianity. And they go head to head. It's a remarkable text called the Dialogue of Trifon. And we see that Justin's conversion was not simply um, one where he was able to speak about it and learn about it and he became an expert and be able to, you know, kind of speak to anybody who, who came his way, even though he could. And this great, this great man, Justin Martyr, wrote letters to the Roman government and to all of these other people, which were called apologies, which meant, meant defenses, defending himself and defending Christianity. And these uh, texts, thank God, thank God, are kept until this day. And we have a text from his trial, when he was put on uh, trial and when he was killed. And this is um, one of those first-hand accounts. It's like a courtroom document that we would have now, an official text that, thank God, was preserved. And you have these, I won't read the whole thing, but it's a group of people, maybe six or seven of them, and they're being questioned by this guy named Rusticus, who is a prefect. And, he, you know, he's just going, you know, name by name, tell me further, Kariton, are you also a Christian? Kariton said, I am a Christian by the command of God. Then he turned to uh, another person and he says, are you a Christian? He says, I am a Christian by the grace of God. And then he turns to another, what are you? I too am a Christian, having been freed by Christ. And then, you know, and then he goes a little further. Were you a Christian because Justin made you a Christian? He said, and, you know, Hyrax says, no, I was a Christian and will be a Christian. And Pion says, I too was a Christian, but I was taught by my parents. Um, uh, and then another guy says, I'm a Christian, you didn't ask me. I'm a Christian too. You know, and we see the simplicity and the conviction with which they preach. And all they say is, I am a Christian. But it's not a Christian by word, a Christian by action. All of them were killed. Um, when St. Polycarp was placed in front of a great coliseum of people, and the prefect told to him, you know, preach to the crowd, he said, no, I'm not going to preach to the crowd. He said, deny your faith. He said, no. He says, for 86 years, I have been his servant, and he has never done me any wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king to save you? You see the power of conviction. Now, this was the personal encounter on a kind of day to you know day to day, and I, I don't want to draw the picture out for you, but you guys should be making the connection that we have so many opportunities. I mean, I read these stories and I want to kind of you know run to my neighbor's house and mow their lawn, you know, do something <laughs> for it, for for somebody, you know, and. Uh, I was reading a story, I was listening to a podcast, I don't know if any of you listened to uh, Morning Offering by um, Abbot Trifon from Fashion Island. So he gave us actually the one for today or yesterday. He said, I was in, um, I was in a coffee shop doing my work, you know, typing up uh, the correspondence. And he says, and two young kids came in and one of them said in a very loud voice, only an old man would believe in God. So, you know, something, he, he looked at them, he says, I looked at them, I smiled, and then I went to the cashier, I ordered two gift cards, and I left. I said, give them the gift cards, and I leave. They said, two weeks later, he came back, and they were there. They said, can we sit with you? And, uh, and then they started to speak, you know, like, why did you do that? You know, you heard what we said, why, why did you do, give us those cards? And um, he said, because God told me to. Yeah, and, and, and then, and then, and then the, the boys were, were embarrassed. They said, you know, please forgive us. I said, I, I never had, I forgave you when I left. I had no problem with you. And this, this interaction, this interaction of love, but also personal, even, you know, even the ones that, that have bad things to say about us are oftentimes, and this is what he says in his podcast too, oftentimes the ones who we must engage, must engage, not just, you know, that's, you know, Christianity 
advanced. I'm not there yet. No, these are the ones we must engage. Another nice example, and, and somebody's got to keep track of time, because I, I don't... How much time do I have, Tom? One hour. Ten, ten more minutes? <laughs> I'll finish up with <laughs> So, another thing that was in the... In terms of personal encounter, was uh, I'll just give you a unique example, but it's something that we ought to think about. It was in the Christian schools that were established, the the school of Alexandria and, and the school that Origen uh, started in, in uh, another location. There was a, a pagan student of Origen's whose name we mention every day in the liturgy or all the time in liturgy. The Gregory the Wonder Worker. Gregory the, the Thavmatos, the, the, the Wonder Worker. So there's three Gregories that we, um, we speak about there. Gregory the Wonder Worker um, was placed as bishop. So Gregory enters as a pagan into this Christian school that Origen has. But Origen, in the way that he engages everybody, he engaged them where they were. And he, it was a welcoming, they were all welcome to come to the school, anybody was welcome. But he engaged them where they were, spoke to them about the sciences, spoke to them about what we call today as apologetics. Spoke to them on all different levels, and then, you, over time, Gregory the Wonder Worker, who gave a eulogy for Origen, he said, uh, you know, just, he, he captured me with his, not only his knowledge and his speech, but also with the way he lived his life. Now, this transition to what? Gregory, the theologian, ends up becoming, or sorry, Gregory, the wonder worker, ends up becoming a bishop in a place that has 17, probably about 17 Christians. And he becomes a bishop there, and through his wonder working, his miracles, <laughs> And, this, and, and the, the faith that he brings, which, you know, he was pagan. Origen was the one who, who, who gave him the seeds. And he ran with it. And he was able in Neo-Caesarea to establish a powerful diocese and to be a wonderful saint that we, till this day, remember in our liturgy. The power of personal encounter uh, was remarkable. And so often, so often, it wasn't that the person would see it immediately, but it would happen later on in life, uh, that the person would realize and understand the seeds that were thrown at them early on. Now, when we think about the other groups of people, the, the Jews and the pagans, the inquirers and the faithful, we have to understand that when the church went out, it went out as a church. It didn't go out as individuals. Even Christ, when He sent out people, He sent about two by two to understand the idea of that fellowship and the idea of that worship, and that idea of that ch the church is going out. And so when we see these great examples of Peter preaching and bringing people into the church, it's wonderful to see the second chapter, they say 3,000 enter the church, and then there's a miracle that happened in chapter 4, and then it, the number was already up to 5,000. 5,000. Um, you see the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit. And when he went to the Jews, he emphasized the message that the Jews need to hear. The suffering, death, resurrection, exaltation of Christ with a call to repentance. And then when Paul and others went to the pagans, they gave defenses of Christianity in a way that could be understood by the other people. And if you study the early complaints against Christianity, you know, and we're talking about pagans, we're talking about non-believers. If you study the early kind of writings of those people that were against Christianity, it, it's, it's no different from the modern atheists of today. It's the same, the same exact, with maybe not even with science, is, is there much of a difference? So, I mean, there is a difference, but there's not, you know, it's the same spirit uh, that of the attacks that happened back then with the same attacks that happen now. Now, the last two categories, the ones of doing missionary work to inquirers or to catechumen and the idea of doing missionary and evangelism to the faithful need to be understood in its proper context. When somebody in the early church, we'll talk about 1st, 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, came to the church, how long were they taught before they were allowed to enter? Between two to three years. 
And we're talking about a time when life expectancy was not super high. Two to three years of the gospel message. Not just, you know, this is how you have to do the sign of the cross, this is when you bow down, this is when you fast. This. No, this is to understand the death of the mysteries of God. Two to three years. And now everybody comes at different times and different points in their life. And of course, after, after Christianity became, I would say, popular, uh, this, this has kind of been switched around, changed. Um, and, and is no longer, we no longer have this mentality of the idea that we have to teach those who are coming to the church. You know, imagine you were somebody that was ready, willing, desirous to learn about Christ and the church, and that you were told that you had to spend three years, you know, learning. If I get somebody sometimes, if I get somebody and tell them you have to wait a year, I don't see them again. A year. That's just because I want to, I want them to see everything that goes on in the church. I don't want them to be surprised by a Good Friday or something, or a, a popular slide, and they say, what is this? But it's important to see the whole liturgical cycle. And also, you know, we have to understand our concept of church. We understand what's in the church, but sometimes we have too rigid of an understanding of what is outside of the church. Uh, and, and this is uh, somebody, for example, who has committed a sin is told you can't take communion for a certain number of months or years. Uh, we, we don't understand them or we don't look at them as outside the church. They're not people that are, you know, not going to have somebody like we're in this situation, and uh, and we're to, we're asked, you know, we're upon their deathbed immediately. Immediately they would be brought back into the church through communion to to give you kind of the understanding that it's not about punishment, but it's about rehabilitation. It's about teaching the person to uh, to be holy, pure, whatever, and it's to help them in their treatment of their spiritual illness. So this is something that we have to kind of think about when we talk about what do we do in terms of our mission. Sometimes we want the short-term missions, but not the long-term missions. And sometimes it's about speaking to somebody for years before they are welcome, feel welcomed, or feel like this is the right thing for them. And also, we have to understand in our churches, we have to create programs, and I know I'm jumping the gun here, but we have to create programs and environments that are welcoming to those who are outside. People can just come and join. Now, when we talk about the faithful, we have to understand many people are born into the faith. And this is, a, I, I see primarily the job of the priests and the Sunday school teachers, that many people being born in the faith don't necessarily understand the faith. So when I started in the very beginning of the talk saying that that is the, you know, being sent out into the world is that final benediction, apostolic benediction. Many people in our church don't know that. They need to be retaught the gospel. Mm. I know that that's kind of bold and not nice to say, but a lot of times we need to be retaught what is that gospel message. Too often, we are like the Jews, forgive me, who say we have Abraham as our father. And what that means for us is we say, I'm a, I'm, I go to church, I say my prayers, you know, that's enough for me. You know, I'm Orthodox. That's enough for me. We need to go beyond that. And we have to understand that evangelization process doesn't stop once somebody enters in the church, but it continues and it has to be strengthened. I, um, I posted yesterday uh, on my Twitter, I, you saw it, and some other people saw it. St. <laughs> John Chrysostom had a quote and said, Each one of us is responsible for the salvation of his neighbor. And this is not just St. John Chrysostom. St. Saint, uh, Saint Anthony said, our, our life and our death is with our brother. Our life and our death is with our brother. And uh, St. John Chrysostom, you know, kind of trying to tell people it's not about how we speak. I mean, there was a time where there was just people were talking and speaking and saying this, that, or the other thing. And they were saying these things in terms of in terms of what? In terms of this is the faith, this is what you have to do. This, And he said to them, you know, he says, you know, brothers and sisters, he says, we have to strive to persuade others, not with our words only, but with our lives. Because even if we speak very philosophical, theological things, and we give examples of this in the saints, it doesn't profit us at all. And this is what I think is the, is the sort of takeaway from the study of the early church, is that 
the people in the early church, they lived the gospel and were willing to die for the gospel. And this is something that in our day and age, when we look around and we see how do we process all this, we, we begin, when we, talk, when we speak about locally, we begin with ourselves. And then we begin with our families, and we begin with our friends, and we begin with those who are in our immediate communities. Because it's there that God has given us people to talk to. And then, and then beyond that, on fire, we move out of from Jerusalem to the rest of the world. Uh, this is just a, a big, a, a short preview. And I, I brought a couple of books that um, you guys all have. Amazon can get get it online. Also, you can come to St. John's. There's a Bible. Uh, there's a book sale <laughs> during these days. Um, feel free to come. We have most of these times. Uh, Spread the word by uh, a priest named Michael Kaiser. It's published in Conciliar Press and um, Reclaiming the Apostolic Tradition of Evangelism. I really like this book. It's really easy and nice um, and uh, a good read. For the more of a historical and understanding the, the, the beginnings of the church, Evangelism in the Early Church by Michael Green. This is a, a very important book for those who want further uh, readings. Um, church, World, and Mission. This, this book will make you cry, make you depressed. It'll make you feel like nothing is going right, make you feel like we are more backwards than we really thought we were. Um, and this is for, he meant to write that, he was writing towards the, the Russian Orthodox Church and the OCA, so he had that in mind. Um, I asked one of the, I'm, I'm about halfway through reading it again, I've been reading chapters here and there, but I, I was asking somebody who read it recently, I said, is there a silver lining at the end, is there something good at the end of this, or am I going to cry the entire way through? Uh, this is a book that convicts you. Uh, and, and for all of us that want to be convicted and need to be convicted, this is an important book. Church World Mission by Alexander Schmemann. And finally, this book's out of print, but uh, if anybody wants a copy, I don't mind copying it. Um, the Gospel and its Proclamation in the Early Church. Thank you for listening.